I believe that he can heal anything. He no way to reproduce something genuine of that. Impurity, <laughs> debauchery, the sensual moves of the person. And then, and then look here. I want you to see this morning that you don't have an option when it comes to forgiveness. Remember that, right? And and they, you remember that? And they put you in a circle, and you you be there all night until you show no way your sermon title today. To read for legion for God. You know, many of us develop businesses and ministries, but we don't leave room for God. Give God some glory. All right. So we are in a series called Respect Yourself. And this, the, this particular title today is about change. To modify or to alter something. Now, you do have a lesson this morning. The, the lesson is change can be difficult, but... It is doable. I'm going to test the ages of some of the people here today, so don't get insulted. But how many people remember something called an eight-track tape? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, just say, uh-uh. Don't raise your hand. Just say, uh-uh. And so, uh, how many people remember something like, um, um, I, I don't know how far you guys go back, but do you remember something called a 45? Just say, uh -uh. To say, all right, so, so, so when they came around and they, they got rid of our 45s and our albums and, and, and they came up with something called a cassette tape, when they made that change, you had all those albums that you had bought, all those 45s that were stor stored away, and the last thing you wanted to do is to go out and buy more tapes. But then you realize that you could play your tapes in your car. And you start finding some good things about it. And then later on they moved to, you know, now, they, now you don't have to do anything. It's all stored in your phone, right? You know? And, and, and you fight against change and then when it actually happens and you embrace it, you see the benefits of it. That's what it's like in Christ. You know, we fight what God is trying to do with us. He's trying to change us to make us better. He's not trying to hurt us. He's not trying to take anything from us so that we'll, we'll, we'll be less fruitful. He's trying to change us for the better. And so we're going to talk about change today. Now, here's the outcome. The outcome is you will enjoy those benefits. You will enjoy the benefits of change. I want you to look at this quote. Here's a guy. He's actually a country uh, music writer. We know him because, he, uh, because of his sausages, uh, Jimmy Dean. Listen to, what, listen to what he says. He says, you can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. Come on, that's all change is. It's coming up with a, with a new way to be successful. It's trying another method to make sure that the job gets done. Here's your definition this morning. Transformed. It is to change in condition, nature, or character. Convert. I want you to look at a Greek word today. It is metamorpho. -o. Metamorpho. -o. Listen to what it says, and I'm going to give you a scripture to match with this. Strong's transliteration 33 39. To change into another form. To transform or transfigure. I'm going to go. To Romans. I'm going to go to the 12th chapter of Romans and I'm going to read to you. I'll get my Bible straight here. I'm going to read to you 
And so I, you notice every time I give you a Greek word, I always give you the Strong's transliteration for that Greek word so that you'll know how it's used in context. So you can say a Greek word, but Greek words have so many different meanings. So I give you the transliteration number from Strong's so you can match it to the scripture. I'm going to read you the scripture that matches with this word, metamorpho. Listen to this. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I'm talking about being transformed this morning. I'm talking about letting God come and, and do a work inside of us that feels so different that we know for sure it's him. Why? Because we wouldn't push ourselves that hard. This is how you know that God is speaking to you. You are already seeking this change. He's ministering to you right now. You're on the right track. Yes, this is something that's necessary. Why? Because you're going to accomplish more. I want you to look at this. Three critical points this morning. Change has come. I mean, it, it's arrived. It's already here. Your, your, your second critical point is change is here presently available. Any and every one of us can change. And then, change is Christ. I have to let you know what the identifying source is. Not, I'm not talking about the change that you do, you know, how you, you change for somebody that you, you, you love. I mean, I, I'm not talking about that type of change. I'm talking about change in Christ. Why? Because it's a permanent change. It's something that you feel proud of. You ever, you ever went to, um, you know, you ever had uh, maybe you had an aunt in the family that needed you to do something and, and nobody really did much for, but you went over to her house and you helped clean up and you did all these different things and you had a feeling, nobody knew but her, but you had a certain feeling inside that, wow, I did the right thing. And, 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 and for the rest of your life, you can remember that feeling how nobody told me to do it. I knew it was good. I knew it helped her. That's the type of change. That's what you feel in Christ. When nobody else is around, that's when you do your best ministry. This is the change that I'm talking about. Change has come. Change is here. And change is Christ. Now I want you to go with me to a small book in the New Testament called Titus. Now this guy, we first hear about him in Galatians 2. Paul begins to write about him. He's a young man and he's traveling with Paul. Paul is incarcerated under, uh, in Rome, but he's under house arrest. When he leaves that incarceration, he travels with Titus to a place called Crete. When Paul gets ready to leave Crete, he does the unthinkable. He asks Titus to stay there to oversee the churches. Well, many people say, well, this was unheard of because Titus was probably a really, really young man. What's unheard of about, what's unheard about this is Titus was not a Jew, nor was he circumcised. And so he is called to take on this awesome task of teaching the Jewish population who we all know are well-learned. They've 
study the Old Testament. They know it verbatim. Even, even when they go through their first, uh, their, their, the first part of their learning, they have to know all of the, the Old Testament or the Pentateuch. You see, this is one of those populations that can be intimidating. But don't all of us in here know what it's like for God to call us to do something that we feel like we're not qualified for? That's when you do your best work. Why? Because you got to lean on him. Your, your credentials didn't get you there. You have to lean on Christ. And so he's writing this guy, Titus, some dated somewhere around 64 AD. I want to read to you Titus 2.11. Listen to this. He says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Didn't I tell you change has come? You know what I like about this? It says all people. If you love people, you know what it's like to have a prayer for each one of them that you love. You know, you got that brother, you say, oh Lord, I pray that he gets his life together and that, he be, and that he's a good father. Uh, uh, Lord, uh, you know, I, I, I pray for my coworker that, they, that they, they learn how to be a little more kind. Oh, God, I'm praying for a mama that she doesn't worry so much. If you love people, you, you have a prayer. You're always thinking about, oh, God, you do something special for them. And there's nothing like knowing that they can change. It's nothing like feeling the change that God brings to us. When I look at this first point, change has come. I can remember when change came in my life. And many of you, as I look around this room, I remember when change came in your life. And I thank God that he did not leave us out. That he saw something in us. Can I, can I ask you this? Can I ask you to take that change and allow other people to benefit from it? Can you, can you take that goodness that you've, you've felt and that, that new life that you're living, the, the, you know, all those things that you used to do and you don't do them no more? There's somebody out there that will listen to you that won't listen to anybody else. Can you use that change to help them enjoy the life that you're living? Let me take you to the next verse. Verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Well, what is that? that those are things that are in, in, in direct opposition to what God wants us to do. God is not trying to hurt us by telling us to do things that are bad for us. He says, say, this is Paul writing to Titus. He says, say no to those things. And then he says this, and to worldly passions. Now, this might require a little bit of explaining. Worldly passions, those can be those things that are indirectly are opposed to the Word of God. You know those things that you do and you say, well, I don't see anything in the Bible that says don't do it. You know, like, I, I know it's nobody in here, so, you know, don't, don't get all offended, you know, if I ask you, you know, I, and I don't know nothing about sack of weed myself, okay? But if we were talking about weed, and... and the legalization of marijuana doesn't necessarily make it good for you. But one would argue, Pastor John, there is no, nothing in the Bible 
uh, specifically relating to me smoking weed. And the government has now come along and said that weed is good. And, and if I were talking to that person, they might, they might roll up one right in front of me and say, man, go ahead, take a puff. And I know what y'all are thinking right now, but I say no. <laughs> Let me keep moving. What I'm trying to say to you, what I'm trying to say to you is this. You are going to be faced with some things in your life that you know are not right. These worldly passions, you're going to have to be the person to say, wow, that's too much for me. Just, uh, listen, some of y'all can't handle these videos. Those girls are naked. You can't handle it. Turn it off. I know you oh, Pastor John, you legalistic. You, you, you trying to make them stop. You can't handle it. It make you go nuts, those girls up there with no clothes on. Why don't you just turn it off? Like all the young people say, man, mom, don't bring me back here again. These worldly passions. What he said to you is that I don't want these seeds inside of you because they'll be cultivated and they'll grow. That's, that's all he's saying. He's, he's saying, I don't want these things to be a part of you because they will grow. And remember this, whatever you feed the most will grow the strongest. If you read your Bible every day, your spirit will grow the strongest. But if you feed your lust, it will grow to overtake your spirit. And so he goes on to say this. He says, and to live self-control. Let me stop right there. Discipline. To live disciplined lives. There's nobody in this room that loves to eat more than me. <laughs> and, and I'm going to ask all my friends to be quiet. Don't comment, the people that see me eat. I love to eat. I, may, I said be quiet. <laughs> Who said amen? There's no one that, but even I have to say to, you know, wow, I can't, I can't eat three veggie burgers. Even just because just they're veggie burgers don't mean I can sit up and eat three of them. I, and, I, and I like to make them, you know, I make them, I put them on the George Foreman grill, right? And then I get those um, frozen checkers fries. I don't know if y'all get those. I, I, I put the frozen checker fries on there, right? And then I flip it over with some cheese. I put a little bit of this stuff. Y'all don't know about this stuff. This is like, uh, it's like Miracle Whip, but it's got like relish in it. Speak, speak, Nicole, be quiet. It's got little, little Miracle Whip stuff in it. And then I make that cheese on it. And man, I tell you, I could sit up and eat three of those things. But listen, listen. I, well, I don't. I don't eat three of them. At least I haven't lately. But, but, but listen to this. There's a self-controlled life that I have to invest in. There's something called discipline. You know what it really means? It means that don't do everything that you want to do. Don't train yourself to be spoiled. Sure, I could do it. I'm not going to go to hell if I do that. But what I'm doing is I'm disciplining myself. I'm saying, you know what, this is not, this is not good for me. Because one, if I eat them all up, there'd be enough for anybody else, right? Things like that we have to look at. I wanted to use just a light example because you can think of some other things where we need to be controlled, but just something like that. We need to be disciplined. Listen to what Paul says. He says, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I want you to know that change is here. He wants us to live godly and upright lives. He wants us to live clean. Now, now don't look at this as being condemned. You know, don't look at this as being, well, I don't have a godly life and now God doesn't like me. No, no. What happens here is this is something that says this life is available 
to and for you. Th this life allows you to live clean and unobstructed from demonic forces. Don't you, don't you, don't you feel that now? You know, some of, some, some of us that, you know, are, are now we're reading our Bibles and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're transformed in Christ. And, and you have this feeling inside of you when you, even, even when you leave here today or throughout the week, you have this feeling, you just feel good. It's, it's like, and nothing's going right. But you feel good. You know, you're, you're down on the mortgages. You don't have it all. Um, bill collectors might be calling. People on the job talking about cut, job cuts. Um, all these things are going on. But there's a peace inside of you. Why? Because you know Christ is going to take care of you. You don't know how. It's kind of like on, on a roller coaster, I, I guess getting on a roller coaster. No matter how many times you get on that roller coaster, you always, I guess, you're scared when it takes a loop or a dip or whatever. But some kind of way, you know that you're going to come out all right. And I enjoy this roller coaster ride with Christ. He's not going to come and tell me everything that's going to happen tomorrow. What he's going to do is say, trust me. If you're obeying me, you're in good hands. Change is here, right? This nanosecond, it's here. The God that we serve is available. I want you to look at this. Go to verse 13. It says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. While we wait for that hope, while we believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back for us one day, while we believe that the God that we serve will prevail over the evil, the people that are coming against us, that are treating us unfairly, we reach out to God and say, God, this is not right. And doesn't it always seem like when people are treating you unfair that they're getting away with it? You know, I mean, don't, don't you kind of say, God, hurry up. You kind of want to tell God what to do with that. It's like, God, hurry up and get him. But God knows best. He's, he's coming to our rescue. He's already come to our rescue. You know why? Because those people that are coming against you, they're far more miserable than you are. Yeah, I used to tell my wife all the time, you know, she would say, um, I, I don't, I, you know, because she doesn't argue. And so she, she would tell me about sometimes how people would, would say things. She was like, well, you know, I, honey, I don't, have, I don't have a comeback for that. I don't study how to get smart back with somebody. You know, and you know how you'd be thinking, you'd like, man, if he had said that to me, I would have said this, right? You know, <laughs> or if he had said that, you know, and then sometimes you get home, you think about it and say, wow, I should have said this, right? <laughs> but, but, but here's something that I told her. I said, honey, those people are so angry that even though they said everything that they were thinking, they're feeling worse than you. They're feeling worse than the person that they just cussed out. Why? Because their rage has gotten the best of them again. Don't you think that those per people don't go home and say to themselves, God, why did I let this thing get so far out of proportion? Don't think that they go to bed at night saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. They go to bed at night saying, God, I did it again. I, I, I can't believe I blew my top once again. And they don't know how to apologize. They feel worse than the people that they belittle. But you don't know that because they've hurt you so much. And so you're just feeling like, God, get them. God, get them. Believe me, God got them. Go with me to verse 14. Listen to this. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. Can I stop right there? Can I, can I, can I remind you that Jesus Christ died for us, purchased us back, 
to the Father so that we could be eligible to live forever in heaven. That's when, when, things are, when things are not going well. You know, when the children are not doing what you raised them to do. You know, when the wife is on the war path, when the husband is not doing what God has called him to do. This is what we need to be thinking about. The bigger picture. This is how it's, this, this is how, this is how God makes it so easy for us to be able to get along with one another because in the end, nothing matters except for the fact that we're all Christians. That there's nothing that's so big that we can't work it out. That, that, that we as a family will, and will one day dwell with our Lord. Can you get excited? Can you get excited about that? I mean, just, I'm not, I'm not trying to rile you up or anything like that. I'm just asking you, can you use that source of encouragement to get you through the next argument? To get you through the next disagreement? To get you through even the next debate? Can you use the fact that ah, I'm living for the Lord? Can you use that to understand change? Here's, here's your, your last point of the day. Change is Christ. I want you to just relax in your seat right now. I want to minister to your hearts. Just so just get comfortable and listen to what I'm saying. Change is knowing that God will forgive us for anything that we've done. I've sat before murderers. And while they are going to spend the rest of their lives separated for, from society, I've given them a piece of information that will change their lives forever. That is that the God we serve is a forgiving God. When I say to you that change is Christ, I want you to take in totality the fact that the God that we serve will forgive anybody. Can you take that message from this sanctuary today and spread it to your friends and relatives? Can you let people know that the thing that they've done in the past, God is ready to forgive them and accept them to do his will? I'm going to say a prayer with you. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me loud enough to hear your own voice. The prayer is not going to change you, but believing it will. I look around this sanctuary today I see people that love Christ I see people who have sacrificed their lives for those around them so I by no means want to devalue what you're already doing but can I encourage you to go a step further and I encourage you to treat every person that you come in contact with as though it's their last day on earth. When I served as a chaplain in the hospitals, I knew what it was like for someone to code. And each one of us chaplains would say, God, I wish I had an, opportun had a, had an opportunity to talk to that person before they coded. 
Can you take that attitude out of the sanctuary? Can you be that forgiving force? Can you be that driving force in someone else's life to say, I'm going to tell you about the God that I serve. Would you repeat after me loud enough to hear your own voice? Father, in the name of Jesus, please forgive me for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died and was raised for my sin. Please accept me, God. Lord, today, I commit to you and you only that I will do my best to not only tell people I thank you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name. Let us all say amen. Let's give God some glory. Would you stand with me for the benediction? Would you stand with me for the benediction, please? And now to a God who can do anything. God who has set the sun in place and allowed us to take breath daily to a God who is able to forgive and to change Father we leave this sanctuary preaching and teaching your word with our lifestyle loving one another God regardless of the blemish God as I dismiss this special group of people God that you ordained to be here this morning God I pray that they will hear and obey your words we thank you for all these things and we praise you in the name of Jesus let us all say amen God bless you in the name of Jesus. Hug somebody on your way out the door.